church. It is good to be here with you all. Uh, Pastor Randy is out this morning. Um, he's up in McAllen with our Acts 29 uh, sister church uh, storehouse. So <clears throat> be praying for him. Uh, he, he's up there. I'll, I'll be preaching. Obviously, I'll be preaching with us today. Um, first time guests. If you're a first time guest, first of all, welcome. Uh, we are so glad that you guys are here. Um, you should have received one of these. You should have one of these. If you're a first-time guest, go ahead and take this, uh, fill it out, and then after the service, over here at our welcome table, you could take it. Uh, myself, my wife will be there. We'd love to say hello to you. Uh, just welcome you, get to know you. Thank you for uh, joining us this Sunday morning. Uh, for the rest of us, you guys know the drill. This is our, um, uh, our prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests you would like for the pastors, me, and Randy to pray for you over, um, go ahead and fill this out, <clears throat> put it in the offering basket at the end of the service, and, um, and then I'll send out an email throughout the week, and me and Pastor Randy will be able to pray for you. So again, if you guys have any prayer requests, any, any information that you'd like for us to know about, um, I, I, I would love to see what those prayer requests are. I'd love to be able to pray for you. I know Randy would as well, I think that's all we have for our announcements. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for uh, just coming together to gather as, as a body of believers who profess faith in you, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray over this time. Um, I pray that uh, as we study Scripture, as we as we look at what um, your word teaches us, Lord, I pray that it just b blows up our lives, Lord. I, I pray that it just changes us and shapes us and, and chisels away at us, Lord, so that we can look more and more like uh, Jesus. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you uh, speak through uh, me this morning, Lord. Uh, I pray that your words come through this morning. Lord, I pray for clarity of thought, uh, and then I also pray that we're just able to just understand, and, and, and that comes from you, Holy Spirit. So I just, I pray that, Holy Spirit, we are all sensitive to the way you are leading us, the way you're instructing us, the way that you are moving us this, this morning. <clears throat> pray this in Christ's name, amen. Welcome. Uh, we are starting a new sermon series. We, we just kind of finished Colossians, and we're going to start a new sermon series on the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a short little four-week sermon series. Um, and, and like I said, we're, we're going to study the Holy Spirit. We're going to look to see who the Holy Spirit is. So it's going to go for four weeks. Uh, at the end of these four weeks, we are going to have, on, on June 5th, we're going to have a birthday celebration. Uh, the birthday celebration is going to, yeah, woo, happy birthday. The birthday celebration, it's the birthday of the church. Now, not, not River Church, but the global church. It's, it's known as the day of Pentecost, uh, and that's going to be on June 5th. We'll have some cake and stuff after the service. It'll be, it'll be really nice. It'll be really, <clears throat> uh, uh, re, 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 really, um, it's going to be a good time. Now, <clears throat> we're going to be celebrating the day of Pentecost, and, and what I want to say is River Church, us, us group of people, we would not be here today if that day didn't happen. Uh, so the, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit is poured out on uh, the, the, the gathered believers in Jesus, right? If that did not happen, we would not be gathered here today. So it's a big day. It's an important day. It's a day worth celebrating. Um, it's going to be nice. Um, and it's a special day, but, but and, and it deals with the Holy Spirit being poured out onto the church. And it's a day that the church was born. But, 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 but the fact is, not a, not a lot of us know um, what to make of the Holy Spirit, right? We, we know He's important, but we, we don't necessarily know what to do with Him, right? M many of us think, man, if Jesus were here, 
everything would be much better. Life would be so much easier, like I would be able to see Jesus, he'd be able to tell me what to do, tell me what not to do, I'd have more clarity, uh, he would able, uh, be able to teach us, he would be able to encourage us, <clears throat> we'd be able to follow him better if he were here. Uh, now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I know I've said this. I've heard many people as, as, uh, throughout my Christian life say the same thing. Man, if Jesus were just here, then my life would be so much, it would be so much easier to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus understood this. and it's, it's, When Jesus resur uh, resurrected, he was with his disciples, and, and he tells them, in, in John chapter 20, he says, Jesus said to him, he's talking to Thomas, right? He says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Imagine that. Blessed are those who have not seen Jesus, but have also have still believed in Jesus. It, now, now as, as, as we long to look at Jesus, we long to see Jesus, as we all wish that Jesus were here with us, would you believe that, that Jesus actually says to that, it's better that I am not here. It's better that I go away. If I go away, then I will send you my helper, right? So as much as we want Jesus to be here and we think that he would solve all of our problems, right, he says that it's better that he goes away. Now recently, uh, we were invited to go swimming at a friend's house. And uh, <clears throat> my kids, they, they love to swim. Well, they love to splash in water. They don't know how to swim yet. Um, but, but they love to be in the water, right? Bath time is pretty eventful just because it's a tub full of water. Um, anyway, so we were invited to this uh, pool, uh, this, this uh, friend's house, and they had a pool, and uh, we were able to go swimming. Um, and then, again, anytime we do this, my kids are always like, man, this was the best day ever, right? I'm like, come on, guys, we've done so much for you. This is the best day? Um, but... <laughs> But, but they're always excited to get in the water. Now, I have three boys. Um, Joshua's one, so he can't really swim. He's just being held the whole time. Uh, but but, but Matt, Matthew is, is the carefree child, right? He just jumps in the deep end, and he trusts that somebody's going to catch him or be there for him. Uh, but my oldest son, William, he's, he's very calculated. He's very... Uh, he, he, he processes the whole thing. He's like, okay, if I jump here, how deep is it here? Can I touch the ground? What if I were to jump in over there? All right? He's, he's very thinking through. He's very careful, and he's thinking through uh, the entire, in, entire situation. Right? Do I have a floaty? Do I not have a floaty? Like, what's the temperature of the water? Where's the wind coming? Is it from the north? All right? That's my son. That's William. And uh, so he's very calculated. Now, he also loves having a good time, right? And so at this pool party, they had a slide. And so he was like super excited to go down the slide, but he was also really just careful about the whole process. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, so, but he had a blast. And I knew that once he got up the slide, then once he started going uh, through the slide, he was going to have a great time. But it was just hard to get him to that point. And so William, he would climb up the slide, sit up at the top, and he would... You know, I'd be standing there waiting for him. He's like, Daddy? I was like, yes, son. He's like, are you going to catch me? I'm like, yeah, I'll be right there, son. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, get closer. I'm like, that, son, I'm like right here. No, get closer. So I get closer. He's like, okay, da okay, William, I'm ready for you. He's like, no, Daddy, get closer. I'm like, son, you're going to hit me in the face, right? <clears throat> um, get closer. Get closer, Daddy. Get closer. Are you going to be there? Are you going to catch me? You sure? Yes, son, I, I will be here. Right, and so finally, finally he came down the slide, and I got him, and all was right in the world. Right, he gets up freaking out, like, oh my gosh, but got him, right, taking care of him. But this happened every time, and, and so what, what <clears throat> I could only imagine what it would have been like for him, though, if I was like, son, you're up there, you're scared out of your mind. By the way, I'm not going to be here, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here to catch you. 
I'm going to go inside, right? I need to take care of something inside real quick. Don't worry, though, son. Don't worry. I'm going to send someone to you, but I myself am not going to be here. I couldn't imagine what his response to that would have been. Yet this is exactly what Jesus said to his disciples. In John chapter 16, verses 5 through 7, let's, let's read Jesus' words. He says, But now I am going to him who sent me, going back to the Father, going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. <clears throat> How did his disciples feel? They felt sorrowful, right? They were sad. They were worried because Jesus was leaving. But again, he says, it's better that I go away. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is telling his disciples that exact same thing. Theologians, now if you were to look at, uh, read a book or, or something to this pa- about this passage, this passage is known as the Upper Room Discourse. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it's, it's Jesus' last teaching with his disciples. Okay, as, we en- as they entered into the city of Jerusalem, as we celebrated Palm Sunday a few weeks ago, as he enters into the city, uh, he's about to be crucified. He has one last meal, the last supper with his disciples, and there was a string of teaching just before uh, the, the, the administration of the last supper. And so this passage is found in that section, right? It's near the end of Jesus' ministry, and Jesus is telling them that it is better if I go away. Now think about, think about these men, right? Some, some are fishermen, some are tax collectors, right? They weren't very popular amongst the crowds. They didn't have much going for them. People didn't naturally flock to want to be around them. Right? These are the people that Jesus is with, and he's telling them that he's going to leave. Those people, the, the fishermen, were a lot like us. And again, Jesus tells this group of people, it's better that I go away. Imagine that. Now, it's important to know that <clears throat> Jesus isn't just bailing on him. He's, just, he's not just leaving, just fleeing the scene. All right, you guys, I've, I've been here. I've tried to do all I can. You guys figure it out. That's not the case here, okay? Uh, but he, he, he is leaving, but he's saying, I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus is not here, if he's leaving, and he says that it's better that he is not here, and he said that he's going to send us the Holy Spirit, then it would be super helpful to us, for us, to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. The problem, though, there's a problem here. The problem, though, is we don't know exactly what to do with the Holy Spirit. Like what, what do we do with, with the Holy Spirit? Right? Some people, when we think about the Holy Spirit, it's hard to, to ask you to think, you know, what are your thoughts on the Holy Spirit? How do you uh, uh, think? How do you imagine what is the Holy Spirit like? Uh, some of your thoughts would be, <clears throat> uh, you, you would view him as, uh, as just like a wind uh, that, that gives us this emotional, emotional high, right? Uh, some of us would think that... Um, uh, it, it, it obligates us to maybe doing these miraculous gifts or speaking in tongues, right? All of these sorts of things. It, it could give us a, fun, a fuzzy feeling inside. 
over the past 20 years in the church, uh, I'm sorry, 120 years, so since the 1900s, we've seen in the church, we've seen the rise of the Pentecostal movement. Now, while, while I do believe that this is a good thing, generally speaking, I'll explain that, generally speaking, um, we have seen some stuff on TV maybe where the pastor just waves his jacket and a hundred people fall, right? Or some, some, some stuff that we necessarily can't understand, but we have seen those things. And because we can't understand it, we're like, oh man, I don't know what I want to make of the Holy Spirit, right? That looks crazy, right? That, that, that doesn't look like that could really happen. So you know what? I'm just not going to worry about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to kind of push him off to the side. Right? You may have some friends who are, um, uh, who are Pentecostals and, and, and they talk about you know, speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit and all of those sorts of things. And you're just like, okay, what do I do with this? Now for some uh, just history on my end, I actually grew up in a Pentecostal church for like 12 years, of my, the first 12 years of my life. So I've seen a lot of this stuff. I've seen a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. And I see how there is confusion as to what to make of it. Historically speaking, <clears throat> uh, this is an interesting idea. Histor at, at the result of the Enlightenment, as, as we started to focus more on empirical science, right, the things that we could observe, the things that we could study, the things that we could monitor and, and, and study over time, as this, as this became... Um, and drenched in our culture, and drenched in the way that we think about things, uh, what has happened as a result of that is we've kind of pushed the Holy Spirit to the side. We, we began to focus on things that we could observe, and we have neglected the Holy Spirit. Now, whatever your uh, opinions are. You may have some, some baggage with the Pentecostal church. I understand. Um, but what I do want to say is I, that it is good. Uh, the, the, the rise of the Pentecostal movement has been good in that it has caused us as Christians to reconsider the Holy Spirit. Okay, what is the Holy, who is the Holy Spirit? What, is, what does He do? How do we handle the Holy Spirit? What, what, do we, what do we do with this, the third member of the Trinity, right? God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. As we are saying, though, there is much confusion in regards to the Holy Spirit. And again, we just, as a result of this, we just kind of push the Holy Spirit to the side. We stick to the concrete things. And in doing so, we thwart God. We restrict God. We don't worship God to his fullest. And how devastating. <clears throat> how devastating. So at this point, at this point, I just want us to see that, man, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's a big deal. Especially, you know, he's part of the Trinity. He is a big deal. Um, we affirm him. You know, we all would say that we believe in the, uh, the, the triune God of the Bible, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We would all say that. We all do say that. We all say that God is one in nature, three in person, the Trinity. Right? We are comfortable with God the Father. You know, we pray Heavenly Father all the time. Uh, we are very familiar with the creation account. You know, uh, God the Father, we are comfortable with that. Some of us are fathers, right? Some, all of us have a father, and so we can make sense of a father. Right? God the Son, Jesus, you know, we celebrate Christmas every year. We celebrate Easter every year. Right? <clears throat> it's not very hard to, to get us to think about and, and understand Jesus, but not so much with the Spirit. 
Now, again, we're going to spend the next four weeks leading up to the day of Pentecost. Uh, we're going to spend the next four weeks understanding uh, who the Holy Spirit is, uh, understanding the work that he does. And my hope is that I want us just to love God and worship him fully and completely. Right? I don't want us just to worship God the Father and God the Son and leave out God the Holy Spirit. No, I want us to worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has an important and specific role, the Holy Spirit does, in the Trinity. And it's crucial that we understand Him and worship Him and experience His work in our lives. <clears throat> so to help us better understand the question, uh, who the Holy Spirit is, to help us better understand and answer our question, who is the Holy Spirit, uh, we're going to answer, uh, we're going to answer two sub-questions, right? Uh, the first one, who is the Holy Spirit? And then following that, what does the Holy Spirit do? So question one, who is the Holy Spirit? The first thing that we need to see is that the Holy Spirit is God. He was in the beginning with God. Genesis 1, 1 through 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit has been there eternally with God the Father and God the Son throughout all eternity, right? All eternity. It's not God the Father, God the Son, and then later on the Holy Spirit came. They have always existed in all and for all eternity in relation to one another. God the Fa Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Another example is in Acts Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> and in this passage, Paul equates the Holy Spirit with God. He says, But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet, right? So they just sold a property, they made some money, but they held back some of it, and then they gave the rest. And But Peter said, Ananias, what is, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, man, it's crazy. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Right? So he lied to God, and like that was it. Game over for Ananias. <laughs> Breathe his last, and great fear came upon all those who heard it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. In this passage, we see <clears throat> Peter equating uh, the Holy Spirit. He understands that the Holy Spirit is God. Right? So, so the first thing, again, who is the Holy Spirit? The first thing that I want us to see uh, is that who he is, he is God, right? Scripture uh, refers to him as God. He is God. Now, I could pull a bunch of texts throughout the whole Bible uh, to support this, uh, but I just wanted to give us two examples briefly to show us that the Holy Spirit is God. Now, where I want to move, how does this apply to us? What, what do we make of this? The next thing that I want us to see is what exactly, what exactly does the Holy Spirit do? Right, so, so we've seen that he's God, but what exactly does 
He do? How can, how can I know the Holy Spirit? How can I know how to engage with the Holy Spirit? What can I do with the Holy Spirit? And what I want us to see is that He is our helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the helper, to you. <coughs> John 14, 25 and 26 says this. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, right? Jesus is still uh, with his disciples. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, from whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, one of the most practical ways we can view the Holy Spirit, we can worship the Holy Spirit, we can understand the Holy Spirit, is to understand Him, the Holy Spirit, as our helper. He is the helper. Right? He has always been the helper. Right? Uh, going back to the Trinity and His Trinitarian relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, He has been the helper. Right? The Scripture says that the Father and the Son both send the Holy Spirit. Right? Hey, we need to get this done, and they send the Holy Spirit to work on it. In Genesis 1, God created everything, and the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. Right? When, when, when Mary is going to, uh, the Virgin Mary is going to conceive of a child, the Holy Spirit was there with her. Right? In our hearts Right now, the Holy Spirit is doing this work in making us more and more like Jesus. As Christians, He is, he is helping to prepare us. He is helping to prepare us for our future in heaven, for our, for our eternal future. He is doing a work in our lives, right? Sent by God the Father, God the Son, to do a work in our lives, to prepare us, to get us ready for our future in eternity. I heard someone say this, and it just made sense. <clears throat> they, they view the Holy Spirit, and, and again, this, this analogy may break down after, at some point, once you press it, but, but they view the Holy Spirit as an extrovert. Right, the extroverted member of the Trinity. He's the one that's going out. He's the one that's doing the things. Now, so generally speaking, the Holy Spirit is a helper, but how does the Holy Spirit help us? Right, so we, we talked about, thus far I've talked about the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit is God. Right, the Holy Spirit is our helper. Right, how does he help us? Right, that's the question that we're going to answer next. The first way he helps us is he helps us to see, to see Jesus accurately. He helps us to see Jesus accurately. John 16, again, we've been in these passages in John. John 16 says, I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. Verse 14. He will glorify me. Jesus says that. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I, say, uh, therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it 
to you. So what is the first thing that I, I want us to see? Jesus, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit helps us see Jesus. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit makes much of Jesus. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is what allows us to see Jesus. It's, it, it, it's what awakens our hearts to the gospel. He, the Holy Spirit, He is what brings Scripture, the Scriptures, to life. <clears throat> Now, I have, a, I have a friend, and uh, this, this idea of, of the Holy Spirit allowing us to see Jesus, right? I have, a, I have a friend who I used to work with, and I remember this one time. I'll never forget, right? This one time we, we, were, we were, like, in a meeting or something, or maybe we had some downtime, and we were, we were able to talk. And so, <clears throat> um, we, I, so I printed out a little passage for him. I was like, hey, man, like he's always been curious about the Bible. And I was like, all right, hey, man, check it out. I want you to print, we're gonna print this out. Let's look at it together. We'll study it together, right? And so, so we did. <clears throat> and so I remember I asked him to read it. And so he read it and I read it. And then, and then once we had finished reading, I said, okay, man, tell me, you know, what do you, what do you see in this passage? And again, this person is not a Christian. The Holy Spirit does not live inside of him. And so what do you see about this passage? What's this, pa what's this passage about? And I don't remember what the passage was, but I do remember that once we had finished having that, I, I finished asking him that question, as he began to answer the question, he completely missed the point of the passage. He completely missed the point of the passage. Now, I want to uh, throw in a disclaimer. He, he's, not a, he's not an unintelligent man. In fact, he's a very intelligent man. Right? He, he prides himself on his knowledge. He has, he, he's a well-educated man. He's a well-read man. <clears throat> he has uh, multiple master degrees. Right? He knows he's a very, again, a very smart man. But as we read through the Scripture together, he completely missed the point. The story that we had talked about was about Jesus, but he did not see that. My friend who I care deeply about, he couldn't see Jesus in the story. He could not see Jesus with his eyes, right? He could not see Jesus with his eyes because he did not have the Holy Spirit in his heart. He could not see Jesus with his eyes because he did not have the Holy Spirit in his heart. We see similar examples of this in John chapter, uh, in, in, in the scriptures too, in John chapter 5, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, You search the scriptures, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. Jesus is telling the Pharisees that they, they too are missing the point. They cannot see that the scriptures are pointing them to Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps us to see Jesus clearly, and he helps us to walk in his ways. But they can't see him. They can't see him. The only way it is possible to see Jesus is the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. <clears throat> So, 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 again, how does the Spirit help us? As a, as a recap, the first way is that He helps us to be able to see Jesus accurately. And the second way that He helps us is He helps us to see ourselves accurately. He helps us to see Jesus accurately, and He helps us to see ourselves accurately. Accurately. John 16, 7 to 8 says, again, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the help will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. 
Hear this. Verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgments. He helps us to see ourselves accurately. Right? Negatively put, he will convict us. Right? The Holy Spirit will see that, man, I should be looking like Jesus. I don't look like Jesus. Right? My, there are areas in my life that I need to chisel away. The Holy Spirit will convict us in that manner. The Holy Spirit will allow us to see those things clearly right? as, as our minds are becoming more and more conformed into the knowledge of our Creator. The Holy Spirit will convict us when we are not lining up to what we should be doing. He will convict us in ways that are in opposition to God. So that's negatively put, right? He will convict us. Right? Again, this is all under the Holy Spirit uh, allowing us to see ourselves accurately. Right? How does he do that? He convicts us. The flip side to that coin is that, or positively put, the Holy Spirit will bring us peace. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's in Colossians, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 14 and 15. It says, Above all these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Verse 15, And let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Right? Peace Peace and conviction are opposite sides of the same coin, right? They both are the result of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, and they allow us to see ourselves accurately. They allow us, the Holy Spirit allows us to see ourselves accurately. Paul says in this passage, let the let uh, the peace of Christ, the, the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts, right? The Lord will convict us, right? That's not having peace. Or we will walk in his ways and experience peace for doing so. Our hearts won't be troubled. In what areas is there conviction in your life? In, in, what, in what ways has, has the Lord been, or in what ways has the Lord been pressing on you, right? Hey, Billy, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing that instead. All right, first of all, I'd like to say that that is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is helping us to get back on track. Right? He is urging us to walk in the truth. He is urging us to walk in step with Jesus. <clears throat> in closing, I want to look at what do I want us to do. So as I, as I prepare this message, as preaching this message, as we hear and learn about who the Holy Spirit is, what do I want us to do? Right? What do I want to do for myself? How do I think we should apply this to ourselves? How do I think you should apply this to your life? What do I want us to do? I want us to approach the Holy Spirit as our helper. I want us to approach the Holy Spirit, to pray to the Holy Spirit, to seek, to, the Holy, to seek the Holy Spirit as our helper. And, and this, isn't just, this isn't just to convict us of sin, but this is also to give us the strength and the power to walk in peace, to walk in His ways. Again, I just preach this, I, I quote this passage almost every time I preach, but Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, again, 
Old Testament. Israelites don't know what they're doing, can't do it. And God tells them, and I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you, I will cause you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Man. This is the Old Testament, right? The, the Israelites are not getting it right, and God says, I'm going to put my spirit within you, and I'm going to cause you to walk in my ways. Man. <clears throat> Do you need help understanding your Bible, right? Maybe sometimes you read through the Scriptures, you're reading through a certain passage, maybe it's your morning devotional time, whatever it is, maybe, and you're having a hard time seeing Jesus, you're having a hard time uh, getting mental clarity with, the, with your Scripture passage, with your, with your devotional, that morning, you have a hard time engaging in the text, ask the Holy Spirit for help. Maybe you need help discerning what to do. Is this, is this a good godly move or is it not a good, or is it a sinful move? Should I not be doing it? I don't know exactly what to do. Maybe it's not as clear as like this is right and this is wrong. Maybe there's a little more nuance to it and you need some, you need some wisdom, you need some guidance. Pray to the Holy Spirit for help. Maybe, maybe you need strength doing what God has called you to do, right? Maybe you have to do something and you don't want to do it, but you know you have to do it. Pray to the Holy Spirit for help. I had to make a tough decision uh, last week and uh, I had to make a phone call as a result of this decision and I did not want to make the phone call. I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so bad. Um, it wasn't bad at all, but it's just how my mind works. <clears throat> but I pray. I was like, Lord, give me some strength Give me the strength I need to be able to do this. Uh, whatever it is that you're calling me to, whatever it is that you're asking me to do, Lord, strengthen me to do that. It can be as simple, it can be as simple as when you wake up in the morning, pray to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead me today. Holy Spirit, lead me today. Holy Spirit, allow me to walk in your ways today. Holy Spirit, keep me from swerving to the right or to the left. Holy Spirit, lead me today. John 6.13 says, I'm sorry, 16.13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Holy Spirit, lead me today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you um, for this day, Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you for indwelling us, Lord. Thank you for filling us. Thank you for pointing us to Jesus. Lord, I pray over uh, us today, if we, if we uh, some of us in here, maybe we, we don't know exactly how to engage you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we just, just look to you as our helper, Lord. We look to you uh, to lead us in the ways that we ought to, to walk, Lord. Lord, as a result of our, our study of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that we are able to love you more fully, uh, worship you more completely. And Holy Spirit, I, I pray that uh, you just continue to, to live in us, Lord, continue to... Um, uh, to, to continue to keep us from swerving to the right or to the left. Cause us, Holy Spirit, to walk in your ways, Lord. Praise in Christ's name, amen.